Hi guys and welcome back to Greek Mythology for Cal State Long Beach. We're going to be looking at Roman mythology. Um, a lot of times people think or talk about Roman mythology as if it just came entirely from the Greeks. Like they didn't have any kind of stories or they didn't have religion or they were worshipping like Jeff the God of Biscuits or something silly like that, right? And then they go into Greece and, oh, finally, we have religion. Thank God we got it from somewhere, right? And that's not the case. They actually had a very well-developed religious system. They did have stories, although they weren't, uh, we don't have writing for them, so we don't know what those, a lot of those stories are. But they did have a lot going on. And then when they encounter the Greeks, or when they go down into Greece, they tend to syncretize and adopt more of that stuff. But the other side of this is also, it's not like Greece and Italy developed independently, right? They're not completely separate. They're actually in very close proximity. So a lot of the deities and a lot of the ideas are very similar already because of that close proximity. All right, so let's get started and take a look at what's going on in the, uh, in the Greco-Roman world. Uh, so first of all, in Italy, we don't have Romans per se early on. We have a lot of tribes. We have a lot of groups running around and they're in communication with each other. And two of the big ones that influence Rome the most are the Etruscans and the Latins. So the Etruscans, um, are a big tribe nearby, and I'm going to take a look and see, there we go. Um, and they had their own religious traditions and deities, likewise with the Latins. Um, and this all gets mixed in with the Greek ideas. And of course, the Greek ideas are not independent and like spontaneously coming out of Greece either. It evolves and they're ba really highly influenced by the Levant. So uh, in Syria, Israel, that area, and also on Cyprus, right? So that's all coming out of there. And there's you get a lot of talk about uh, Phoenicians and stuff in the in Greece, but those guys are coming out of the east. They're coming out of the Near East, the Middle East, right? Um, so a lot of this gets mixed up. Um, and so I want you, I, I just want you to really start thinking about uh, Greece and Italy, and even the ancient Near East as kind of a more fluid. Uh, fluid cultural situation and not so much independent uh, areas like they have walls around them or something, right? So note the Mediterranean here. I've got a map here. It's not huge. It's not a gigantic place. Uh, and there's a lot of trade going on. And it's going on for a very, very long time. Uh, we don't get a lot of writing uh, until like 800, six, between 6 and 800 BCE, but people are writing before that, and there's a huge amount of trade going on for thousands of years before that. So Greece and Italy are not really separate, and this idea of countries um, being geographically somehow isolated or separate is A, it's a very modern idea, and B, it is completely artificial. The lines that we draw around countries or even states, or even cities, is a very arbitrary thing. And sometimes it's based on natural geography, like a mountain range or a river, but sometimes it's just a line in the sand, right? The thing that separates, if you think about the California coastline, the thing that separates one beach from another is just literally a line in the sand, right? So there's a lot more fluidity moving around this, the areas, around the geographical areas we're talking about, but around the world in general as well. So as far as culture is concerned, there are no lines. Some of what we call Greek religion and mythology stemmed from what is now Italian territories, especially Sicily. Um, so those southeastern parts, taking a look at like the heel of the boot and the whole southern area really is in close contact with Greece. And so those tribes really have uh, more in common with Greece than they do with the northern parts of Italy, Rome, because of that contact, that trade, that cultural fluidity um, is all kind of um, spreading ideas in religion, in language, in 
uh, society, etc. All right. So the first group we're going to take a look at are the Etruscans. Uh, we have limited written evidence, so we don't have a lot of their mythologies, but we do have some of their art, um, and that gives us some pretty decent information. They're very active. The height of their empire was kind of between 700 and 200 BCE, um, and they are a major trading power in the area. So as Rome grows, they end up absorbing and destroying a lot of it, the Etruscan record. In fact, the Etruscans um, are, in fact, one of the major building blocks of Rome as it kind of grows in power. Etruscan civilization is also called Villanovian, and they go back as far as 1100 BCE, the, the origins, right? So I said they were kind of flourishing and kind of at the height of their power between 700 and 200, but their, their origins go back well beyond that to 1100 BCE. Uh, they developed many independent city-states, uh, much like Greece or even, you know, the, um, the Levant, the Phoenicians were kind of the same way. Uh, but so they have these independent city-states and they're politically independent and they function economically independent, but they share culture, they share language, they trade with each other a lot. And so they're not, um, they're kind of like, it's kind of like the United States and Canada, right? We share language, we share culture, except maybe the French part, but that's a different thing. Uh, but we share a lot of culture and language, and yet we are politically and economically separate, right? And we may have arguments with each other, and yet we may do a lot of work together, but we're technically different. Uh, cities on the coast um, of Italy, including Etruscan cities on the coast, developed a lot faster, and they develop a little differently than cities that are inland for obvious reasons. Access to the ocean um, creates a lot more opportunities for trade, uh, and it creates a different culture because you have to deal with um, the ocean as opposed to dealing with land masses around you. So things like your food supplies are going to be different. Um, your architecture has to be different. There's a lot of little things that happen um, based on geography that will skew a culture or society in one direction or another. Uh, let's see here. So their coastal cities saw great impact from culture um, on culture and religion from trading with the Levant, the Phoenicians, and the Greeks. Uh, and Rome was initially part, kind of slightly outside of the Etruscan world, but it began to develop very quickly in the third century BCE. So in the the uh, the two hundreds, yeah, the two hundreds BCE. Um, and this leads to conquest of other cities and loss of most of the Etruscan record. Uh, the Etruscans are polytheistic, and they had a very large pantheon that included deities that were completely outside what we have studied, um, but also includes uh, known figures. So uh, Hercules and Apollo are part of the Etruscan pantheon. They're part of the Etruscan religious system. Big parts of their religion included augury, which goes into Rome, and a lot of other traditions use that as well. Augury is reading omens from natural phenomena, so they might, um, you know, a strike of lightning or a flight of birds or um, these kinds of things uh, would be interpreted as uh, divine communication. Uh, they also used divination from the stars and liver omens, which was incredibly popular throughout the Middle East and throughout the West in Greece and Rome and all the way up into Europe. It seems to have originated um, at least as early as Babylon, probably. Actually, I think we have evidence from Sumer um, going way, way back thousands of years. And this is when you take an animal, usually um, a goat or a sheep or something like that, maybe an ox, uh, and you sacrifice the animal and then you take the entrails out and that would include the liver primarily, but you could use the other entrails as well. And there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of information and written data on how to interpret the condition of the liver of the animal. And we find all over the Mediterranean world and even up into Europe, these kind of, um, clay, uh, livers 
with writing on them, kind of like, okay, this part, you know, if it's, if this part is diseased, here's the problem. If this part is diseased, here's the problem, that kind of a thing. So liver omens are incredibly important as well to Etruscan religion. And we have some of those clay uh, livers that tell us what they, how they interpreted the liver omens. Uh, the underworld may not have been such a dreary place to the Etruscans. The Etruscans seem to show, have tombs uh, that show belief in the afterlife, a definite belief, but it includes images of banquets and ancestors and things like this. So it looks like after you died, you, you had a really big family reunion and you, you got together with your friends and family and it was banqueting and, and chatting and stuff. So, um, it looks like life just kind of continued into the afterlife, maybe not as big of a transition as, um, as it was for the Greeks and even in the Middle East. Uh, the Latins, also called the Latians, um, those are actually, the, the Romans come out of the Latin tribes. And you can see here, I, I circled Rome on the map so you could see where it is pretty close to the coastline, right by a river, which is always a good thing. You know, you get fresh water there. Um, so Rome is one of the Latin tribes, um, and that also becomes the language of ancient Rome. So their language goes way back to this er to era. These tribes go back to about 1000 BCE, and it's actually connected to Etruscan culture. Like I said, these groups are, are living right next to each other. And so, of course, there's going to be communication and trade and all kinds of things happening. So even if the Etruscans have their own language and a slightly different culture, the Latins are going to be very, very close to them because they are communicating with each other. So uh, it looks like they're almost like proto-Etruscans maybe. Um, Rome unites the Latins into a single group about 338 BCE. Uh, but they were... Uh, they were kind of, you know, like I said, very similar to the Etruscans before that, with lots of independent city-states, and but a united culture and language. Uh, but they were not, again, not united politically or economically. So the Latins and the Etruscans, technically a little bit different, uh, but the Latins have, have their own culture, and they are united in culture and language as well. The Etruscans did have a different language, although it, it was related to Latin. Uh, Rome began building its power beyond their own tribes around 600 BCE. So right around 600, you start to see the beginnings of Rome trying to kind of break out of its little area. And uh, by about 500 BC, Rome is kind of the big bully on the block, right? So about 500, they're ruled by kings at the time, uh, and they are already trying to push against uh, all the areas around them and trying to gain control of the tribes around them. So Rome has, um, Rome starts out being kind of a, a bully, <laughs> all right? Uh, please note, the Romans um, in general, religiously and, and culturally, were more conservative than the Greeks. And it's, this is going to be especially true when we get up to Augustus, when we start getting up to, uh, towards the first, uh, the first century common era, they become more and more conservative. And again, this is, like I said, Augustus takes this to a whole new level. Augustus, who is, whose original name is Octavian, but he becomes Augustus when he becomes the emperor. He is the first emperor of Rome, and he is a giant prude. Like, he doesn't put up with anything. And he even exiles his own daughter for being promiscuous. So, yeah, you know, <laughs> he, he, he takes it to a whole new level. Uh, the Romans conquer the Greeks in 146 BCE. The Greeks become a protectorate of Rome, so they, they technically become part of the Roman Empire. Uh, there was already significant influence by this time, though. Uh, there was a lot of adoption and syncretization of the religious systems, and that just really got fast-tracked when, uh, when they conquer. When they go in and they really take over Greece politically and economically, uh, the Romans fast track all of that syncretism and stuff, and they they adopt those stories, and then Roman authors start writing the stories themselves and collecting the the bits and pieces that they can, and then they write them for a Roman audience. Um, early Roman religion. So, 
before this, though, like I said, uh, Rome had their own practice. The Latins had their own practice. Uh, early Roman gods did not have the same human psychology that the Greek deities did. They were not subject to the same kind of um, neuroses that seemed to be uh, part of the Greek religion. What they had instead were more like spirits uh, with specific powers that were limited and they didn't really have evident personalities. And these spirits are called the noumena. All right. Um, they either did or did not answer specific questions and requests. Um, they were very much like um, other indigenous traditions. So if you look at the Native American traditions, if you look at um, or even, you know, really early uh, Middle Eastern traditions, there's, there's kind of this, some very common things that you find if you go back far enough in religion. Uh, you see these indigenous traditions where the, the landscape itself is infused with spirit. And so there might be spirits of the trees and the spirit of the lake. But in Greece, those spirits start to take on personality, the personality of people. They get very anthropomorphic. Uh, in the early, early Roman religion, they're not as anthropomorphic, but the entire landscape is infused with that spiritual significance. Okay, um, so rituals are done for specific gods or spirits um, to do specific things, uh, and the, the request was either granted or not, but it was not dependent on the mood of the spirit in the same way that it is in Greece. So if you go and you ask Aphrodite for something and she says, oh, oh I've had a bad day, I broke a nail, and oh, I just, oh, oh go away right? That's a possibility in Greek religion. Aphrodite might just not be in a good mood. Uh, but that's not going to be the same way in the Roman tradition. But these noumena spirits slash gods kind of become syncretized with their Greek counterparts. And so I've got a few examples of that uh, to take a look at here. Let's see here. So the first one, we're going to start with the king, right? <laughs> or what becomes the king? Uh, and this is Jupiter. Uh, he also gets called Jove, J-O-V-E. Um, and he's actually a very early god. I have the planet Jupiter up there for, uh, so that, you know, kind of help you remember who it is. Uh, he is an early Indo-European sky god. Um, and he, is, he was generally associated with thunder and lightning. And he, he was the head of the pantheon and his bird was the eagle. So you can see on the early Roman shields, uh, we have the lightning bolts and the eagles as kind of representing Jupiter. Uh, he is descended kind of from an earlier sky, father sky deity. And again, you see this kind of thing, um, even in Native American and Sioux tradition, we have father sky and mother earth, grandfather sun and grandmother moon, right? But the sky doesn't really have a, a really big human personality and that the same was true here so they called Jupiter the Thunderer uh, he they also called him Jupiter the Rainmaker Jupiter the Thunderbolt Flinger um, he did get equated with Zeus but like I said uh, Zeus is, or Rome is a little more conservative than Greece and Jupiter didn't really fool around as much in the Roman versions of the Greek stories. So Jupiter is much more conservative. He's much more straight laced, much more um, on the straight and narrow. Um, he, is, he is a god of light. He is a protector. Um, and during defeat, um, he protector during defeat and also a giver of victory. He is unconquered and kind of the supreme general. Uh, he became part of a triad of gods that watched over Rome with Mars, who was the god of war, and um, Mars was also the son of Hera, but not the son of Jupiter, which I think is really interesting. Um, and Quirinus, which is kind of the deified Romulus, and we'll talk about Romulus a little bit later. Um, and But this triad is later replaced by Juno and Minerva, right? And Juno is the counterpart for Hera, and we'll talk about her presently or in just a minute, okay? Uh, the next one is Vesta. 
So the fire is really important in religious life, and you can see why, because fire is incredibly important in personal life. The, the hearth, the, the place where you cook the food, it's the place where you heat the home, it's the gathering spot for the family. The family primarily stays around the hearth in the kitchen. If it's a separate room or if it's not a separate room, you would have the hearth in the center of the home. Um, and so Roman, this Roman idea of, of the communal hearth, of the hearth fire burning, right, uh, becomes expanded. And, and they, you get this idea of the communal hearth for the whole city and eventually the whole empire. And this becomes the temple or the, 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 um, the purview of Vesta, right? And Vesta is the counterpart of Hestia. But Vesta becomes much bigger than Hestia because Vesta is the center of the Roman Empire, right? So the temple of Vesta is the center of the city and it's later kind of the center of the empire. Um, and it was the only temple that was round because the hearth, if the hearth is in the center of the room, it is round, right? Um, if you ever build a campfire, you generally don't build a square campfire because the fire itself is trying to be rounded. Um, and so it, it's the only temple uh, that it ha that's actually round, all right? Uh, Vesta was really a really important figure in Roman political life. She is connected to Hestia, uh, but uh, like I said, had a bigger national importance. If the fire ever went out in the temple of Vesta, it was doom, uh, and someone had to pay, right? And you have these... Uh, Generally, the number is 30 uh, priestesses of Vesta. You have 10 who are in training, 10 who are kind of the official priestesses who actually do all the work, and 10 who uh, might be retired or actually training the, the new people coming in. But if that fire goes out, oh my God, uh, it is doomed for the empire. It is bad. Um, and one of the Vestal virgins is going to pay, right? Right. And that was part of the deal with uh, becoming a Vestal Virgin. You had to dedicate 30 years of your life uh, to the Temple of Vesta, uh, swearing virginity, of course, celibacy. Um, and if anybody ever violated that, there would be massive, massive uh, problems, huge problems to pay. Uh, Romans were very superstitious, uh, and this is going to be this is going to show up in the Vestal Virgins. Like I said, if the fire ever goes out, uh, there's hell to pay uh, because you're dooming the empire. If they ever lost a, a big battle, the first thing they would do is go check to see, did the fire of Vesta go out? Because if Vesta's fire went out, that's why we lost the battle, right? And so sometimes uh, propaganda would be spread that the fire did go out so that the, the uh, politicians didn't look bad. Right. It wasn't our fault. The, 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 the fire went out. So we have to, um, you know, we have to punish the person responsible for letting the fire go out and then we can go back out and do battle and we'll win. It'll be great. No problem. <laughs> All right. Um, in the home, uh, when sacrifices were made, uh, they were burned at the hearth. Uh, so that's another reason why Vesta takes on this incredible significance because she is the one getting the, the smoke up to the gods. Um, and if you left for a prolonged time, if you had to go on a journey, uh, you would actually take the bit of the hearth with you. So you might take a bit of charcoal or some of the ash in a bag so that you could keep home close to you. And, and I, I, I think that's just a really a lovely uh, sentiment where you, you're going to be gone for a while, but you want to keep the hearth fire, the hearth, the heart of the home with you. And so you take a little bit with you. All right, our next goddess is Juno. Uh, she is the protectress of the city um, and later the empire. Her bird is actually the goose. So remember Hera had the peacock, uh, but Juno has the goose. Uh, she is a goddess of love, marriage, childbirth, and the moon. She was the noumena of women. So Vesta was the noumena of the hearth fire, Jupiter was the noumena of the sky, and Her uh, Juno was the noumena of women. Uh, she is the wife and sister of Jupiter. She's a, one of the oldest Roman deities. And again, she's one of the, the, the big three, she, the three oldest deities 
are Jupiter, Minerva, and, Her and uh, Juno. I keep wanting to call her Hera for obvious reasons, but she's actually very old and very independent of Hera and later kind of becomes syncretized, okay? Uh, she, was, she was also worshipped by the Etruscans. Uh, when you were at her temple, uh, no sacrifices could be made unless all the knots were untied. And of course, in ancient clothing, they don't have zippers and buttons are a pain in the neck. So what do you do? You tie the fabric, right? You have a belt that's called a girdle. Remember from um, Hippolyta's girdle, right? Her uh, Heracles has to go get the girdle of Hippolyta. It's not a girdle in the way that we think of, but it's just the belt that holds your clothing down and you might hang things from it. Um, so all of these belts, any hair ties that you have going on to hold your hair up, that has to be untied. All the knots have to be untied when you go into her temple. And one of the symbolic reasons for this is that knots are symbolic of hindrance and childbirth. Uh, when a woman is giving birth, you want to release all of the tension possible uh, so that she can give birth successfully. And one of the ways that you do that symbolically is you untie all of the knots. She watched over all aspects of women's lives. Uh, she alerted the people to anything that might endanger the family. And of course, that extends to the larger community. So it's kind of like with Vesta, right? It starts in the home, but it expands to this larger idea of the city and eventually the empire. All right. And there's a great story about, um, I, no one knows if it's true or not, but there's a great story. Uh, certainly it's mythically true about early Rome <coughs> um, and the city is, you know, the, this little village city, proto city, it's, um, they're asleep one night and marauders come to attack, but the geese of Hera start honking and they start making all kinds of racket and, and a ruckus and this alerts the Romans, the early, early Romans to the problem and so they're able to get up and get out and defend their city successfully thanks to the warning of, of Juno. Uh, March 1st was the Matronalia, and this is the beginning of spring uh, and a time to give your wife a present, right? So it's kind of like a, um, I don't know, sort of a Valentine's Day, Mother's Day kind of a thing. Um, it's also the celebration of her son, Mars. And again, Mars was born of Juno, but not of Jupiter. So she had a, a child on her own. Um, there are some stories that say his that Mars's father was some kind of magical flower, but there's no complete story with this. Uh, but it also celebrated the end of the Sabine War, and we'll talk about the Sabines um, in a little bit. There's more of that to come. So Hera, um, or rather Juno, god dang, I keep doing that. Uh, Juno was an incredibly important figure in the Roman pantheon and in the Roman psyche, and part of that you know, development of Roman culture. And again, she's much more conservative. You don't find, um, Juno is not known for being angry at Jupiter. She's not known for taking vengeance on Jupiter or his kids. Uh, she is a much more of a conservative, uh, mild mannered, uh, wife and mother and protector of the family. All right. Minerva. Minerva, of course, gets syncretized with Athena, but she's actually quite different early on. Uh, so originally, she is the goddess of crafts, wisdom, medicine, commerce, poetry, and the arts. So she's got a little bit of Apollo going on there, right? If we're going to really look at the Greeks. Um, later on, she takes on war, and she takes it over from Mars, uh, but this is only after she gets blended with Athena. So she becomes um, much more Athenian later on. But early on, she is not a goddess of war. She is not, um, she's, that's not part of her purview. That is Mars and done. All right. Uh, she comes from the Etruscans into Rome um, and then eventually gets equated with Athena. But her Roman Etruscan name takes its root from a word for remember. And she's born of Jupiter's head. That part is, is in common. But it makes more sense. Like born of Jupiter's head, uh, 
having to do with memory and ideas and crafting and medicine, right? So being bored of Jupiter's head does not have anything to do with war specifically, right? But again, it later becomes part of her story through the Greeks. Um, as she becomes equated with Athena, she takes on the warrior aspect. Um, and so the, the statues here are actually Roman, but they're much later Roman. And of course, they're based on Greek statues that they copy. Um, she grows in importance. Uh, she becomes the, fo the focus of the Quinqu Quinquatrus Festival, uh, in which Mars was the focus. And this festival is a five-day festival. It started on March 19th. And it marked the beginning of the campaign season for the Roman military. Now, of course, it seems kind of weird for us to talk about a, a season for war. But in the ancient world, this was really common because it's you can't really fight war very well in the middle of winter. Um, and B, people have to go home to, to farm their fields. The warriors, the fighters, the soldiers were also farmers. And all cultures are very much aware of this. And so they, they have to send their soldiers home to work in the fields and farm and produce food. And so there's a, a, a time for war and there's a time for planting. It wasn't really, really strict. And obviously sometimes things go over the due date. But generally speaking, uh, March 19th kind of started the beginning of going out and, and waging war. And she becomes the focus of that, and she takes it away from Mars, which is kind of rude, but there you go. One of the uh, specifically Roman characters that does not get syncretized with a Greek character is Janus. So Janus is uniquely Roman, and he was the noumena of the gates and the ports. But as he evolves and as, um, as his story kind of gets evolved because of all the other stories that are being brought in, he, uh, he, he gets a bigger purview, all right? But he has no Greek counterpart. There is no god of the ports in Greek tradition the way there is in Roman. And of course, you saw that Rome was right on a river and it's very fairly close to the shore. So they're, they're very interested in water um, and ports as well. Um, he is the god of beginnings and ends, of gates. Um, and since he's in that liminal space, that in-between space looking in one direction and the other with his two heads, he also becomes the god of time because he's looking forward into the future and he's looking backward into the past. Um, he is the god of duality, of doorways, and all kinds of transitional places. He looks forward and backward at the same time. Uh, he's invoked whenever there's conflict because he can see both sides. Um, he is invoked in both war and peacetime. And when Ken's campaign season began, uh, his gates were opened. He didn't really have a temple. He had this kind of, round, um, not round, but he had this building with gates on one side and gates on the other. And whenever Rome was at war, the gates were open which was most of the time. But if Rome was at peace, the gates were closed, which I think is really interesting. Um, so he marked the departure and the arrival of troops coming home, uh, especially if they were coming home in peace, they would close those gates. Uh, he was also invoked for births and journeys and exchanges. So again, this kind of, uh, anytime you were in a liminal space, and liminal just means that you're, kind of in between definite spaces. So like doorways, right? If you're standing in the doorway, you're not really outside, but you're not quite inside yet, right? So liminal spaces, so giving birth, um, beginning a journey, or anytime you do an exchange, you're in the midst of that exchange. Money hasn't quite been accepted. You don't have the product yet, right? There's that liminal time. Um, and so he kind of uh, kept watch over all of that. All right, next, I wanted to look at the politics of mythology. Um, a lot of this, whew, excuse me, um, the Aeneid uh, especially is really just fan fiction of Homer, right? And, and it's specifically fan fiction of the Odyssey. 
Uh, Julius Caesar, and we're going to get into a little bit of political history here. Julius Caesar was killed on March 15th in 44 BCE. The problem that Julius Caesar produced or, or created is that he was not an emperor. Technically, Rome was still a republic, but he was pulling power from the Senate um, and the people he had, let's, let's put it this way. He had a very strong base of support among the people and he used it. He, he used it to his own advantage and he pulled power from the Senate by using that power from the people, but he's not an emperor technically, right? He is an emperor de facto. He can do whatever he wants, right? Um, so this question becomes, who is going to succeed him? Is Rome going to become uh, a, a kingship, a tyranny? Is What's happening here? And Brutus, who is a member of the Senate, his family is a long-time member of the Senate, uh, Brutus organizes an attack in an effort to end the tyranny and go back to the Republic the way it was supposed to be. Brutus gets cast as a villain quite often, but he, he's really trying to maintain the tradition of the Roman Republic, right? Uh, one of the founding stories of, of Rome is that they overthrow the kings, right? Uh, king Tarquin is, there's, there's a great story about King Tarquin being overthrown and this establishes a republic of a Senate, right? And so you don't have a single person making all the decisions, which is notoriously bad. Um, and so, Brutus tries to avert this coming return to a kingship, a tyranny. Um, unfortunately, because the people really loved Caesar, his assassination, which happens in front of, you know, traditionally in front of the Senate, was actually in front of the theater because uh, the Senate had been moved to refurb the building. Uh, he gets attacked, he gets stabbed, I think 44 times or something like that. But the people really love C Caesar, and this begins a civil war. And so the contenders are Octavian, Caesar's nephew, and his adopted son, um, Mark Antony, who is initially allied with Octavian. All right, Brutus tries to fight this war for a little while, but it doesn't really work very well. And eventually Octavian and Anthony agree to share power together, but that doesn't work very well because there's only room for one of those egos in Rome, right? The two of them are incredibly uh, egotistical, arrogant, self-important, which you kind of have to be to rule, right? But you can't, it makes it so that you can't share power. So Mark Anthony and Octavian then go to war, um, and the two of them end up going to war for quite some time. And between 44 and 31, there's conflict and problems, but Octavian finally wins in 31 BCE. Now, of course, this is, what, seven years of war? Uh, and all kinds of people from the upper classes are taking sides and trying to jockey for position to figure out who's going to win because we got to preserve the family. Octavian wins. And of course, this is all very complicated and I'm simplifying it. But Octavian eventually wins and he allows people to come and say they're sorry. And then he accepts them back into his good graces, which is great. Um, but what this does is it gives rise to a lot of political mythology and Virgil is one of the ones that's doing this. Virgil writes the Aeneid and it's really a justification for Roman power and might. And he, you know, he writes this story about Aeneas who comes out of Troy, right? So he's going back to the Trojan War the fall of Troy, and he is making Rome the new Troy, all right? But Rome, this Troy is unconquerable, okay? And of course, this gets Virgil into the good graces of uh, Octavian slash Augustus. Um, do, 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 do. Let me make sure I got everything here. Ah, da, 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 da. All right.
Very good, I got it. Okay, so let's take a look at the Aeneid and Virgil. Right, so like I said, it begins with the Trojan War. One of the things that happen is, according to the story, um, is that Aeneas's father, um, Anchises, is out in the field and he's farming one day and Athena sees him and he's this, you know, strapping young man glistening with sweat and blue. But she's, you know, kind of um, enraptured and she has an affair with him. Now, of course, after having sex with a goddess, uh, he, he can't walk anymore. He's been paralyzed. So when Troy finally falls, uh, um, Aphrodite goes to Aeneas and says, hey, you got to get out. Here's a way out. I'm going to help you. And you're going to go off and found another even greater city. And so Aeneas has to carry his father. He grabs his son by the hand and his wife is following uh, his wife fairly quickly gets lost in the chaos, so we don't know what happened to her. Um, and Chises eventually dies, which is fine. Um, but Aeneas sets out on this giant um, quest to establish a new kingdom for himself that would become uh, Rome. Uh, he sets sail for a while. He does end up in Carthage for a bit. And again, this is going to be another political issue. Uh, the story about Carthage is that he goes to Carthage and there's a woman ruling the city who, and she founded the city and she, her story actually goes way, way back, well before Rome. But in the Roman story, uh, he lands and she falls in love with him and they, uh, consummate their relationship, if you will. So she thinks it's a marriage, justifiably so in the ancient world. Uh, but even though he is in love with her and he wants to settle down with her, uh, Mercury slash Hermes comes and tells him to GTFO, you know, get out of there. Uh, it is, this is not your place. You're not here to rule Carthage. You're here to go found, you're stopping off on your way to, you know, create and establish a new empire. So he has to leave. Um, and he leaves Dido without, um, without telling her, without telling her why, without, so much as a, you know, I'm so sorry, babe, I got to go. Um, but, you know, I've strayed from the path. And so now I have to go and, and do my thing. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, uh, this leaves Dido heartbroken and she kills herself. She builds this giant funeral pyre uh, with all of his stuff on it, takes his sword that he left behind uh, climbs the funeral pyre, sets it ablaze, and then kills herself with his sword. Um, and as he looks back from his ship, looks back towards Carthage, he sees the the uh, smoke rising and is doesn't even really know what's going on, but he's sad. Doesn't tell her that, but okay. Uh, he finally hits the Italian coast and sets up camp in a place uh, that would become Rome years later. And so he becomes part of the foundation mythology of Rome and giving Rome its roots in Troy. And of course, by this time, Rome has already defeated the Greeks. And so it's kind of this um, justification for defeating the Greeks, right? Because you defeated Troy and now we are coming back to defeat you um, as the new Troy kind of a thing. Um, another story about the founding of Rome, which is actually earlier, but um, chronologically it gets established earlier, but then the Aeneid comes in and puts a story in front of it. It's, it's confusing, I know. Mm. A woman named Rhea Silvia was a Vestal Virgin, and she's forced into it by her uncle who had usurped the throne of the Latin city, Rome, um, from her dad. So her dad was the king, but then the brother of the king comes in and, you know, kicks the king out. And he tells Rhea, he says, you know, well, you're going to be a Vestal Virgin now because I don't want any question about authority. I don't want anybody asking if, um, if I should be there. And I don't want any young brats coming out of you to challenge me. So she becomes a, ve a Vestal. Um, Mars or Hercules, it's, there's, two different versions, uh, comes to her, has an affair with her, and she is left, of course, pregnant with twins. 
Uh, typical punishment for a Vestal uh, who has been found to violate her vow of celibacy is to be buried alive. Um, but the uh, uncle, the new king, decides that if he buries her alive, um, and the brats that she's pregnant with um, are actually do belong to Mars or Hercules. He doesn't want to piss him off. So he lets, um, he lets the twins not live, but he puts them out to die of exposure in the wild. Uh, the twins are um, found by a she-wolf, and that's the image you have here. And Romulus and Ramus, these are the twins, uh, they um, are then protected and nursed by the she-wolf for a time. And then they are uh, adopted by people who find them, right? So they're taken by the servant to put adrift in the Tiber, uh, found by the she-wolf and helped uh, Rhea is imprisoned and killed. Later, um, the shepherd, like I said, a, a shepherd is out there and adopts them, which is a very typical uh, ancient foundling story of a great hero or whatever. Um, and so, let me see here. Let me see the shepherding thing. Um, later on, they are shepherding. They become shepherds because their dad was a shepherd. Uh, and they meet one of the shepherds of the king, and it doesn't go well. Uh, an argument ensues, and it ends up with Ramus being taken captive to the king, um, and Romulus having to go and and get him. So Ramus is now a prisoner, and they're you know of course they're older, they're young men. Ramus becomes a prisoner. Romulus kind of incites the villagers to help and get Ramus back. Uh, the villagers go and they get the brother back, but they kill the king in the process. Romulus actually uh, accidentally kills the king. Oops. Uh, the brothers reject the crown. They are offered the crown, but they reject it. They say, no, we're going to go found our own city. And they do that. They go out and they go to what are called the seven hills of Rome. Um, and one of them hit, picks like the capital line and the other one picks one of the other hills. Um, and they can't agree on where the actual center should be. And so they decide to consult the gods. And Ramus is on his hill, and he looks up, and six birds fly overhead. And this is a good omen. Romulan, Romulus goes to his hill, and 12 birds fly overhead. And the two of them still can't agree, because Ramus saw the birds first, and then Romulus saw his birds. But Ramus only saw six, and Romulus saw 12, and... Blah, 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 blah. right uh, they still fight Romulus begins construction of his city uh, he Romulus builds a bunch of walls uh, Ramus makes fun of the walls and the two of them fight again and Ramus ends up getting killed and of course Romulus is the victor now and he establishes his city and that city becomes Rome for Romulus and if you're a Star Trek fan Yes, this is where they get the name. All right. The more you learn about the ancient world and ancient Greek mythology, like I said, the more you find uh, the sources for a lot of science fiction and fantasy. <laughs> All right. Let's see here. So Romulus has his city. Um, it's initially uh, populated by refugees and exiles and other kind of riffraff, not entirely unlike Australia or even America, right? Uh, when America and Australia are established by the British, they send the people they don't want anymore. So to Australia, they sent more of the criminals. But to America, they did send uh, people that the king was annoyed with, right? Uh, but the problem is, is that when you do that, there's no women. There aren't enough women. And so this becomes a problem for population development. So... Um, we have a story called The Rape of the Sabine Women. Now, I want you to realize um, the ancient word rape comes from the Latin word rapio, and it means to snatch or seize without permission. And it certainly can imply sexuality, so our common word for rape is a sexual crime, but it's not always necessarily about sex. And you'll notice, for example, in the story of Hades and Persephone, he takes her down to Hades but there's never a word about them having sex. She is the queen, 
they never have, they don't have children together. So it's kind of a, um, I want you to just keep that broader, um, explanation in, um, uh, in mind. So once upon a time, uh, as Rome was growing, the men found themselves without enough women to marry. Uh, the Sabines next door, right, in another city, um, saw that Rome is growing, but they decided not to let their young women marry the Roman men because the Roman men were brutes and, and criminals and uh, the riffraff of society, right? And, you know, I'm not going to give my daughter to that. Um, <clears throat> so the Romans held a festival to Neptune Equestor. Now, Neptune is the name for uh, Poseidon. And notice Equestor, Equestrian, Equus, right? That has to do with horses. So this connection between um, Poseidon and horses is not just in the Greek mythology. This actually goes back and is part of the Roman early, early stories as well. So at this time, we have the Sabines on, you know, and the Romans, and they're at this wonderful festival. And Romulus gives a signal during the festival, and the Roman men take the Sabine young ladies and take them home, force them to go home. Um, <clears throat> Romulus uh, then makes kind of makes an argument for the women to stay in Rome and accept their new husbands. Uh, the story goes, and keeping in mind this is an incredibly uh, patriarchal story, uh, the women see the sense in it and are convinced to stay with their new husbands. In the coming weeks, they become pregnant. Uh, in the coming months, of course, they have children. Um, and the Sabines continue to try to get their women back. And at one point, there's a giant battle over this abduction, right? It kind of comes to a head. Um, and the women supposedly go out on the battlefield, some with their children, some very heavy, you know, very pregnant go out on the battlefield and they say, you know, we would, um, we would rather die than see, um, our new husbands killed and our fathers killed. Um, if we are the source of this battle, then kill us too. And of course the two sides calm down because they don't want to kill all the women and the children that come out on the battlefield. Um, and so that calms them, everybody down. Um, this becomes part of the Roman mythology, part of the Roman um, uh, foundation, part of the foundation stories, um, how the Roman men took these Sabine women and convinced them to stay with these now upstanding good men. I don't know how that argument worked, but there you go. Uh, but this is counted as the first victory in battle for Rome. This is considered, you know, this mythic battle where the Roman women came out and, and you know, were fighting alongside the men, right? So this is a very, uh, Rome itself is a very uh, a battle-oriented warrior culture, and the women come out and do battle with the men in this first battle. They don't go out after that, and it's never okay for women to be on the battlefield, but there you go. The first story of the, the the story of the first battle of Rome. We also have here some of the other deities, and I wanted to uh, show you their uh, counterparts. Uh, Ceres or Ceres is the uh, she was the numina of the grain, so of course she gets syncretized or elided with Demeter. Uh, Diana is um, one of the early numina of young girls, so she of course gets syncretized with Artemis, Pluto with Hades, Neptune with Poseidon, Mars, of course, with Ares. Uh, Venus gets pulled in with Aphrodite, and of course, Vesta with Hestia, which we already talked about a little bit. Like I said, a lot of this is difficult because we don't have written sources. We don't have um, the drawn-out stories from these early, early uh, noumena. And there may not have been a lot of stories about them. Uh, for early Roman tradition, it looks like practice was more important than the mythology. Uh, the ritual was more important. And then the mythology gets pulled in later out of the Greek tradition, or at least more mythology gets pulled in later on. 
So uh, later on, and of course, like I said, this really kind of gets uh, put on steroids under Augustus. Uh, they, the, the Romans start collecting more and more stories out of the Greek world and writing them for the Roman audience. And so a lot of our information, actually, um, quite a bit of it, probably a good 30% of our information about Greek mythology comes from Roman sources because people like Ovid are collecting the sources and, and writing those stories down. Um, Ovid is in exile for much of his life. Uh, he crosses Augustus. He does not get in the good graces of Augustus. Um, he also wrote, Ovid also wrote dating books. So the Ars Amatoria, the art of love. Uh, and it's a dating book. It's how do you get a, get a date, uh, man or woman, you know, uh, how do you get a date? How do you keep a girlfriend or a boyfriend? And if you don't like them, how do you lose that girlfriend or boyfriend? Um, and how do you, how do you get a girl to give it up? Right. Is part of it. Uh, one of the rumors about Ovid and I love Ovid. He's so cheeky. Um, one of the rumors is that he had an affair with Augustus's daughter, Julia. Now, Julia was not an upstanding Roman citizen, given how prudish Augustus was and how, concerned he was about uh, purity, especially for women, right? Women had to be tightly, tightly controlled because you had to control paternity, especially in the upper classes. Because if you don't know who the father is, what if the father is a slave? What if the father is, you know, a farm worker or something like that? Dear God. Um, so you have to control paternity. And here's Ovid, writing books about, you know, how to get a date and get some, um, you know, Ovid is, you know, completely going against, uh, Augustus. So the, the rumor, because Ovid writes in his stories, uh, that he was exiled for, uh, Carmina et Error, a, a, a poem and a mistake. And there are little tidbits in some of the literature that Ovid may have had an affair with Julia. Uh, Julia herself was exiled by her father. Uh, and the story goes that she was exiled for a very long time for promiscuity because she was kind of a hoe. Um, she was, uh, <laughs> the, one of the stories is that she actually had a competition with a prostitute and won. Um, so she gets exiled and the story goes that she actually died coming back to Rome um, later on, years later, came back to Rome and died of starvation in the streets. Um, Augustus was not to be fooled with. You could get on his good side, uh, but if you crossed him, he, he was going to punish you. Ovid ends up in exile. He does well in exile. He's, he's pretty wealthy and he has good connections and he's not a woman, which is a plus in the ancient world. Um, but he never really gets back in the graces of Augustus. So it's kind of ironic that this, uh, poet that Augustus really didn't like has become a source of a, an incredible amount of information and literature from the Roman period. Um, it's often noted that, uh, the Romans conquered Greek, Greece, the Greeks, uh, but the Greeks actually conquered Rome culturally. And in fact, uh, in the later periods, um, Julius Caesar and Augustus, the, I, I'm calling those a little bit later. Um, during that time, if you were educated, if you were of higher socioeconomic status, you spoke Greek, you learned Greek, you learned Greek culture, you read Plato and Aristotle and Aristophanes, the, the poet that wrote the the, the clouds and the toads and the Lysistrata. Um, you read these and, and all of Roman literature is really based on Greek literature. The Aeneid is written in the same uh, meter as the Odyssey. Um, Menander, a Roman uh, playwright, is writing in the same style as the Greeks and using Greek uh, tools and Greek um, literary forms to write his own plays. And this happens for years and years and years. The Romans are really the carriers of Greek culture after they conquer the Greeks. 
and in fact, a lot of the artwork, um, a lot of artwork that we have that we consider Greek is actually Roman copies of Greek work. A lot of the Greek, early, early Greek stuff has been lost, and yet the Hellenistic, that kind of Alexander, Hellenistic, hyper-realistic uh, Greek sculpture um, gets copied by Rome and put into Roman venues. So there you have it, kind of Roman mythology uh, in a very, very small nutshell. Um, I think uh, in our next lecture I might get into a little more of Roman religion, uh, but we'll see. We'll see. I have a ton of your papers still to grade. I only got through half of the really big class, uh, so I got through about 60 of them, and I got to get through another 60 this weekend. So again, unfortunately, I think we're only going to have one lecture, and I apologize for that. I'm really sorry. Uh, but I'm, again, doing as much as I can without losing my mind completely. Uh, so please, again, take care of yourself. Um, make sure that you are staying in and... Um, taking care of your family as well, and I will see you soon. Bye.